lectures. And today I'm going to tell you the very, for me at least, it's very fascinating life stories of three uh, modernist social housing estates um, in, in Latin America. And they were built between 19... 40s and 1970s, and one of them is in Santiago de Chile, and two in Mexico City. And what I hope for um, is that with these stories, we can reflect about, uh, reflect about the complex and contrasting social processes that produce and are manifested in urban space. And hopefully this can be kind of uh, used to open our discussion afterward, um, after this very kind of long introduction. So, um, and I think these stories are not very well known, but actually um, modern architecture arrived in Latin America really shortly after it began to unfold in Europe and in the United States. And as early as the 1930s, uh, several Latin American cities had already begun to plan and reorganize their urban environments, really inspired in, the, uh, in one way or another by the Athens Charter. And in its initial stages, it was like really small uh, projects of, um, you know, private houses or public buildings. But around the 1940s, um, something started to happen then in, in Latin American cities that, or in Latin America in general that uh, rural populations started to migrate uh, to urban centers. And then of course there was um, a lack of housing provision and infrastructure for the incoming population. So several Latin American cities decided to put in motion uh, large pro projects of urban renewal, which completely transformed the scale of modern architecture. And in this process, poor neighborhoods were replaced with affordable mass housing projects. And these were constituted by high rise buildings or housing blocks. And I will refer to them as multifamiliares. We call them multifamiliares in, in Mexico. And a bunch of these together, they would conform densely populated super blocks. And this is a, 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 an image of Tlatelolco and we will look into it later. Now you're probably knowing this image already. And this is a figure ground diagram. And if you're an architect, then you probably knew this. Not, every, not in every country uh, we learn this. And, um, and in architecture, the black represents buildings and the white represents open space. And for some reason, we are taught that these diagrams, um, that we use these diagrams to understand the relationship between buildings and the open space. Um, but, um, you know, between the built and the unbuilt. But I'm kind of cheating here in this image because uh, I have completely decontextualized it. And it would be much more informative if we could see the same image, the same uh, figure ground diagram from the same area, let's say, but in different uh, moments in time, because then it would be, we could see the morphological change of the city throughout the years. And this would then lead us to wonder what influenced that change? Why is it different? And I think that's the kind of only interesting thing about these kind of um, diagrams. And this is the figure ground diagram of our first story or of our first uh, project, which is Remodelación San Borja, located in Chile. And it is a social, uh, a modernist social housing estate, and it was built in three different stages, starting in 1969. And during this period, architects and planners and city officials, well, they felt that the city center of Santiago had become archaic, anti-aesthetic, unhealthy. And it is within this context that a group of architects was brought together. They were called the Cormu. Um, and in, in English, it would translate like Corporation of Urban Improvements. And one of their functions was to, you know, look around the city, acquire land, uh, land and reassign it uh, for social housing or other forms of urban development. And embracing that dream of uh, modernization, then um, in Santiago began to take action towards city renewal and following this process of tabula rasa uh, in the central bureau of San Borja, which was at the heart of Santiago de Chile, well, 300 families were displaced, giving way to a new modern estate. And the planned project consisted approximately of 40 buildings, 40 high rise buildings, and these would surround a park and they would be interlaced with each other um, with a series of elevated walkways, the so-called streets in the air, a product of modern architecture. However, uh, if you're counting, there's not 40 uh, buildings, there's only uh, 20 or 21 buildings. And moreover, and I have marked in green, only a, 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 a short uh, section of those uh, elevated walkways was ever uh, constructed and they only connect for um, for buildings. And the question is, why is that? 
And we will return to that in a second. So this is the image of a model of the project and how it should look like. And I hope you can see my, my, my cursor here, but then we see um, the high rise buildings that they are surrounding a park and then some sections of the elevated walkways and the, the area that I, where we can see it, where there's buildings connected by these streets in the air is this area right here. And let me pause a little here because it is worth mentioning that the period in which these kinds of housing estates were um, started to be constructed was in an era in which um, most of Latin America had had put in place re relatively well uh, welfare states, relatively good welfare states, and they had social agendas and many enterprises were state run and it was an era of industrialization or moving towards industrialization. And uh, there was there, there was a growth in the middle class and there was also a lot of uh, workers and then workers were encouraged and worker unions were encouraged. And in a way, this value of the middle class and the working classes is visible in these projects. And as Carranza and Lara, the authors of Modern Architecture in Latin America, they tell us it was in this period when governments produced some of the most radical experiments for the working classes. And, and I really invite you to look at some of these projects, for example, in Brazil. Brazil. These are amazing uh, modernist projects, uh, even as old as in the 1980s by Dina Bobardi and the Paulista group. Um, but of course, Latin America is huge and things are not happening at the same time. For example, while in Mexico already by the 1930s, mid 1930s, uh, had already had um, an appointed socialist president in Chile, it would be in 1970 that the first Marxist uh, president in Latin America was democratically elected. And also Chile is kind of special in this story because um, some consider that it was a way, the, the, the place uh, where um, kind of the, the beginning of the neoliberal era was imposed in the continent. And on September 11, 1973, the social project in Latin America was brought to an abrupt halt when a military coup ousted Allende and thus ended or starts the end of these benefits provided by the welfare state. And that is probably the reason why uh, the project of Remodelación San Borja was never completed and only the 20 buildings were, were built. And then, of course, without the, um, without the social provision of the state, the elevated walkways deteriorated, as did all sorts of public services. And in the 1990s, well, the neighbors got together, they decided to close access to these areas and to these once public spaces, and they actually remained in a state of abandonment. So let's move on. And this is a figure ground diagram of the Multifamiliar Benito Juarez in Mexico. It was built between 1950 and 1952 in the heart of Mexico City. And when it was concluded, it included not a, almost a thousand apartments, 19 buildings, and it would house about 3000 inhabitants. And it is kind of obvious that there is not uh, 19 buildings here. And you're probably wondering why this is, and I hope you are. This is actually how it, uh, uh, how it looked like uh, in 1952 when it had already been constructed. And you can here clearly appreciate the idea of the super block, the high rise buildings, these um, housing blocks, the clear, um, um, how do you call this association or disconnect of uh, between uh, transit and pedestrians and also very important for the modern for modernism was this kind of um, the idea that it that with these blocks they would liberate the open space so that's what how it looks like how it looked like um, and this was the second of its kind built in Mexico City and it was designed by Mexican architect Mario Pani and he was the son of Mexican diplomats and at a very young age he was able to, to move to Paris and where he studied architecture and then he returned to Mexico uh, to promote the theories of modern architecture and planning and this is actually the way that um, um, modern architecture enters kind of the, the the country through through Latin American architects who went to study to Europe and then returned with these ideas. And because this guy had really good political connections, he was able to obtain many projects in public and private sector. The first uh, one such a huge project was um, the Multifamiliar uh, Presidente Miguel Aleman, which had a, was a project of about 
15 housing blocks. And the second project was this one, Benito Juarez. But then there's a third project, which is the Multifamiliar Nonualco Tlatelolco. But let me tell you, because it's great, the, um, the actual name is Conjunto Urbano Presidente Adolfo López Mateos de Nonualco Tlatelolco. So it was built between 1960 and 1964, also in the Central Bureau of Mexico City. Actually, it's in the same kind of bureau, uh, just a few kilometers apart. And it became the biggest social housing estate ever constructed in Mexico of approximately 100 hectares with a density of 1,000 inhabitants per hectare. And this is how it looked like uh, when it was finished in 1965. And here you can really see the super block. Um, it was the, um, this urban center was comprised by different by buildings of different heights, and it was these and these buildings were distributed in three large super blocks. So I will show you. So um, so and each each of these super blocks was dedicated for a um, population of a specific economic standing. So the first block was somewhere over here, and that would be for the poorer populations. The, the middle class would live in the central uh, super block, and then in this third super block, there would, it would be for the, um, for the richer populations. And, but actually what happened is that the, the idea was that when, uh, that the poor people that were kind of um, displaced at the moment uh, would be able to return, but that was impossible because the construction was so expensive that um, they couldn't return to live there. So the project included 102 apartments, apartment buildings, I mean, and it would house about almost a thousand inhabitants, um, uh, 100,000 inhabitants. It had uh, hundreds of commercial spaces, uh, supermarkets, schools, kindergartens, health and sports centers, theaters, social, social clubs and banks and everything. It's like a little city within the city. And in this image, we can also appreciate a little bit um, some symbolic uh, buildings. So for example, this was a Torre Vanobras. Here is the Office of Foreign Affairs. And here is a, a special place called La Plaza de las Tres Culturas. But let's, let's look at them a little bit. So this is a very iconic building uh, and it's called Torre Vanobras and it, and it would house the public bank that financed all of these projects. And for a while, it was one of the tallest buildings um, in Latin America with 127 meters of height. And at the top, of course, why not? It had a carillion with 47 bells. In the third section, then we had the office, um, the office of Foreign Affairs and um, and it's not as iconic as the other one. It's not as tall, but what is uh, important about this building is that in 1967, the Treaty of the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons in Latin America and the Caribbean was signed there. And we can al already see hints of the next area I want to talk about because this is um, a very um, important uh, element of the, of the complex. And this is called La Plaza de las Tres Culturas. So, um, the, the story behind this is that before the period of colonization of the Americas, Tlatelolco had been an important commercial pre-Hispanic city. And in the 16th century, during Mexico's colonial period, the pre-Hispanic city was partially destroyed with a new colonial, and a new colonial city was built over it. So here you have the pre-Hispanic city, now you have the colonial one. And after Mexico gained independence in the 19th, from Spain in the 19th century, the space became an industrial neighborhood and it was in, inhabited by low income families. And I was noticing that in the back here, you can see a little bit of the lanes that used to be the, um, I don't know, the, like it's not a train station, but where trains uh, would come. I don't know how to call that part. Anyways, so you can see a little bit of that over there, but not really here. And then, um, but then to give way for the modernist housing complex, the area was completely raised, permanently displacing thousands of people. And as you can see in the images, well, there's remnants of the pre-Hispanic city, the colonial city, and of course the modern city. And the, the, anecdote is that when Mario Pani was designing this, um, that's when they found the colonial city, so they didn't know it was there before. And yes, these buildings have conferred the space with stark symbolic value for Mexicans, 
um, but it would be um, in uh, 1968, in the backdrop with the backdrop of the Olympic Games in Mexico, that approximately um, uh, on the 2nd of October of, of 1968, approximately 15,000 uh, demonstrators gathered in the square, square to demonstrate the, the growing uh, authoritarian presidential regime. And, um, and this wasn't actually the one of the biggest marches or anything at all. There had been bigger ones, but this one is kind of representative because the regime ultimately sent members of the military and the police who surrounded the demonstrator, uh, demonstrators and this culminated in the massacre of uh, approximately 300 people. And this event is known as the Massacre of Tlatelolco. And, in, in, and it is thought that through this, um, oppression um, it represented the end of the social mobilizations which were happening world uh, nationwide but it was also the first visible rupture between the mexican state and the society since um, the mexican revolution and um and this rupture between the state and society became concrete as the government dissociated itself from funding the provision of housing. And this led to the deterioration of the housing complexes, public areas and parks. And this includes Benito Juarez, which we talked about before the other housing complex. And in the 1980s, Mexico had com almost completely transitioned to a neoliberal economy. Uh, it had um, now market-oriented po policies, drastically reduced public spending, privatized it run enterprises, and imposed in extreme uh, austerity measures. So these measures left the housing complex in a very vulnerable state, as some say, socially and also physically. And the consequences of that became palpable on the morning of the 19th of September of 1985, when an earthquake uh, of the 8.1 um, magnitude in the Richter scale shook Mexico City, causing the collapse of several buildings, of course, throughout the city. And during the tremor, one building in Tlatelolco collapsed and others were severely damaged and many others had to be later demolished. So in total, uh, 12 buildings were demolished in Tlatelolco and eight in the Multifamiliar Benito Juarez. And uh, I can show you, I didn't want to put up, uh, it's very impactful images of these huge blocks just collapsing. So this is one of those blocks that co collapsed during the earthquake. And then these two had to be uh, demolished afterwards and this one over here. Um, so after the earthquake, um, the demolished buildings were never reconstructed. The government declared that they would be made into parks, like the areas, the open spaces would be made into parks, but that never quite materialized. Actually, it was some uh, uh, people who lived there that started to do those little parks in memory of the people who had passed away um, through the earthquake. But um, Many families fled the area, of course, and others were homeless and forever displaced. And to this date, a lot of public buildings in Tlatelolco remain abandoned, including Torre Banobras, this uh, triangle uh, looking or pyramid looking building, and other plots uh, where once buildings stood while well, they were abandoned. So going back now to the figure ground diagram. Now we know that this image tells us absolutely nothing, not even about the buildings it is supposed to highlight and less about the relationship to the unbuilt. But if we start to look actually at what happens when we start to see the unbuilt and as it happened to me, we start to find things we did not expect and learn stories that we would otherwise never know about. We would not know that on the elevated walkways of Remodelación San Borja, there is an event called Music and Plants that young people get together to repair the deteriorated walkways, add plants to the abandoned uh, um, urban garden, organize events for children and, uh, and families, and create a space for emergent artists to present their wor work while other artists play live music in the background. We know that it was it is actually we would not know that it is actually a group of students like the majority of you who visited the site and discovered the unfinished streets in the air and um could not bear to see these once public spaces closed and we we would not know that with no resources to restore them physically they instead restored them through cultural activities and collective action 
if we did not look at the unbuilt, we would not see that on the voids left by the government and the demolished buildings after the earthquake, other forms of life emerged around the city, most famously actually in Tlatelolco. We would overlook the networks of collective action and care that were created after the earthquake to help people in need. Um, I, I didn't um, make notes of it, but there was um, so many people were left without housing and the government just completely cleaned their hands. And so people self-organized and created the, the organization, which like I said, I didn't, I don't remember the name, but up to this day, they help people in need after earthquakes. But then we would also not see that in one of those abandoned plots um, of Tlatelolco, was transformed into a um, center of urban agriculture and that it was created by a woman that dreamt of growing organic food in the mega city and that this space gives meaning to her life and makes her feel fulfilled and um, and that this um, and that in that space has uh, with little resources it has become a place where knowledge is produced and reproduced even elsewhere like for example in Huerto Roma Verde so if we continue to learn about urban space through this abstract representation, we would not know about the empty promise of building parks and public spaces on the abandoned sites of the multifamiliar Benito Juarez. And we would fail to notice the reappropriation of its open spaces and, and its transformation into a center of urban agriculture, into a place of culture, as well as social and circular economies. And more important, uh, we would miss the creative work of people constructing the most interesting structures out of scrap and garbage and teaching others to see beauty in them. And we would also be surprised to learn that on the 19th of September of 2017, exactly 32 years after the earthquake of 1985, another mega earthquake struck Mexico City and both places, Huerto Tlatelolca and Huerto Roma Verde, became strategic sites to organize help brigades, distribute donated goods and provide tools to make way to, um, through the rubble to rescue survivors. So to be clear, I have nothing against drawings. I believe that they are powerful tools to understand the world around us, but I am totally against the complete abstraction of that world. And I have told this story elsewhere, but back at home, one of my first tasks as an architectural student was to decontextualize an object. And in a country such as Mexico, where more than half of the population lives in informal settlements and precarious conditions, in a country with a dubious democratic system and where human rights are constantly violated, I was being taught not to see what is there, to ignore the context that we have so carelessly constructed. And kind of back to the theme of the lecture of adulthood, now myself one, uh, I can now understand that the great failure of modern architecture was its complete disregard to context, treating space as devoid of people and history. And in this historical moment, you know, in the midst of a pandemic and the climate crisis at the door, we must learn to see the whole picture and draw new understanding of the world around us. So, well, I didn't know how we wanted to do this, um, this little um, kind of discussion, how to open this discussion, but um, an invitation through this uh, idea of the adulthood would be that we start to think of ways of renewing our ways of seeing the city. And that was a little bit um, the idea behind um, the idea behind the Padlet that I, um, I had put together here, that we would, that was my very stupid question, how can we learn to see what we don't see? But, um, but instead of having this kind of rhetorical question, let me stop, of what do we do, that we actually do share stories of how you in your own countries, uh, in, with your own experiences, how are you actually uh, learning to see things that aren't there, or what would you like to do? And if anybody wants to propose any things. And there was a very, before I end, there was a very good one, <laughs> almost like a riddle that said, I'm afraid that if they would see what we see, they won't, wouldn't give us a chance to do what we do with the things we see. I think we can learn to see the things we don't see from the ones who see what we don't. So, 
someone from you wrote that <laughs> and if you care to elaborate would be great but anyways i think um that's what i what i leave uh to this uh, discussion this conversation thank you thank you dahlia that was super great and so energetic also for the fact that we, we the question that you asked now makes even more sense but i think we European in general, we are, we are so Eurocentric that we don't see things happening in, in other countries as such like other continents. So that was really great. And if, if you, if, this is kind of an informal talk, so feel free guys to comment, start, but if you need some minutes to, to think about what happened, don't, don't worry. And Thank you yeah. very much, Nadia. Yeah, if you have any questions or comments, just let us know. If you don't want to turn on your mic and your camera, you can always just send it in the chat. Yeah, and I have created this space, but nobody has put any questions. <laughs> but you can also put questions. And you need, you need time for that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also nice because I think sometimes like uh, architects play a lot in the ego than on the real needs of the of the community and of the place and you explained that perfectly I think. I think uh, we have a, a one comment and I'm going to say it on behalf of ISM it's very interesting that you mentioned obviously you're talking about Mexico and you mentioned the year 2017 because at our first launch uh the exhibition that was accompanying the launch was from francisco campus who basically did a photo journal of remnants and displacement as a result of the earthquake which uh just found really interesting and and um uh coincidental that it just so happens that we're discussing this on this uh talk but um i think a second sort of question and comment uh trying to both the uh, the way that you're speaking about adulthood and, and the way that you've been speaking about temporary urbanism and tying this back to uh, what our the thing that we are currently looking into, which is identity, particularly decolonization, is something that we're, we've been really interested in. And uh, it seems um, really interesting how, as Eduardo said, we're very Eurocentric here and we have sort of enforced this onto other con countries, particularly with uh, modernist housing blocks, which are by no means um, natural and vernacular to Latin America. And despite this identity without context being enforced on the people, uh, it seems really interesting that now they are reusing this through tactical urbanism and are basically creating a new uh, identity and a new space from themselves with the remnants of these buildings that were enforced um, in a sense. So this was, it's really interesting to see that these spaces that were void uh, have now become spaces of interaction and time spaces uh, during crises, like you like you said. Um, so, really, is something great. And if I can add something to that, I would say that I think it's also a problem of of modernism sometimes that is lacking identity, and it's it's a kind of machine that could be replicated everywhere. But then, <laughs> I mean, it's an earthquake that can give it the possibility to. I mean, it's a bit tragic, but at the same time, you, you saw the identity coming up after that. So it, it's pretty weird and interesting at the same time, the failure of modernism and at the same time, the opposite. Yeah, the silver lining. But I do want to say one thing that um, it's very interesting, uh, modern, um, the way that modernism um, is in Latin America because it did it did adopt of course this complete European thing but uh, but then it made it its own and I didn't show a picture of that but if you look at some of the images they really had artists doing really amazing murals in these in these buildings and then they were like in the staircases and when the buildings collapsed these were completely bare and everybody could see them so there is some certain um, yeah they adopted something from here but then they put uh, their own little thing into that. So it is quite interesting. Um, I have to say they're quite interesting. And I'm, yeah, I'm very, very, I have been there in, Tlatelo, in both in Tlatelolco and Benito Juarez. 
And there's something there. <laughs> there was some, uh, like in the middle of Mexico City, you have this place where you can be completely disconnected from cars. And this is just, we're in the world. Like it's really this huge uh, super block, you no, know, completely in its own little bubble. So it's quite interesting, yeah. The difference between that block versus the rest of the city is also because obviously we saw that in the little plot in the plans that you showed but also the photograph the aerial views that's when you realize the monstrosity that it actually is even though it's been adapted even though it's taken uh, the basics from Europe but it's been adapted in one way or another to Latin America um, that whole idea of building without uh, too much attention to context despite that they have tried to create these um, um, worthy spaces of living and domestic spaces for people, it just seems uh, to be so alien compared to the rest of the city, in a sense. It is, <laughs> but it's also quite interesting to be in there. <laughs> and also about this identity. Um, okay, now it's completely diverting to the identity, but um, but it has such a bad connotation. Like people would tell me, how could you be there uh, walking alone? And right, it has it has gotten a new identity. When it was built, actually, there were these famous people and professors who wanted to live there. No, it was kind of this, you know, the whole modern um, society wanted to live there. And then all of a sudden, 68 happened. And I think that kind of pushed people away. It stigmatized it, but then the earthquake completely changed who lived there even because people fled. Those rich people who could pay those buildings, they fled the area, but then a new people will, could come and live there because the rent prices were so low. So it completely changed the composition of the area. Um, so I think that's why I think it's uh, interesting uh, stories. And yes, of course, it's completely alien to the area. But um, yeah, or any other comments? Otherwise, maybe we can go through some of the comments uh, in the Padlet. Can I just ask you something before? Yeah. Because um, I was a bit curious about the relation. You were speaking about this kind of um, that were growing in this area that looked quite spontaneous. And it's kind of funny because now it's, it's happening all over the world, but in a more um, directed way, like urban gardens and growing vegetables in the city. But what is like the relation between the community? Like, what is the feeling of that? That I have to say, it's also it's quite a kind of European it, way to see that. It's also quite kind of, um, I would say not, not, okay, first of all, that Latelolco is huge, no? So it's very hard to talk about this, this one uh, unique or uh, homogeneous um, um, group society living there, first of all. The people, for example, in both, in all of the cases, nobody comes from these areas. So these are really kind of reappropriations from someone who saw an opportunity there and then transformed that space. For example, I know in Tlatelolco that there are people who lived there or live there that worked in the huerto, but it's not precisely these, um, you know, oh, we're happy and we go and we do it. No, the person who kind of lead the leader, let's say, of this project, she has to live from that. And that is kind of a struggle and not everybody in the community accepts it, but not everybody rejects it. So it's not, it's also complex relationship actually between those, um, those spaces. Now the other one, Benito Juarez, the one in Benito Juarez, Huerto Roma Verde, that is an occupation. And it has been, at least from the stories that I heard, it has been um, kind of positive because it, it is an occupation. The Huerto Tlatelolco is not an occupation. They have permission to be there. The other one is an occupation, but the government has seen um, the value, the social value, and especially after 2017 with the earthquake, um, that it, they just can't kick them out. You know? So it has been kind of, there's a bigger, maybe a bigger relationship also because they have helped um, kind of reconstruct through the through these networks that they make within those groups no they have helped also kind of rebuild or create certain things for those um building blocks that are still standing there in the in in in, in benito juarez yeah but those relationships are complex i have to say yeah i think we maybe tend to kind of create a bit 
the reality is more hard. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone have any, I, what's your concept of identity or comment you would like to share? I think there was a couple of questions on the Padlet. Um, I was just going to say something. Sorry, I couldn't get myself off mute. <laughs> I'm great with technology today. Um, I think it's very interesting how uh, in the voids of these blocks and in these spaces, because you are researching the reappropriation of space and after the destruction of these buildings, especially after 2017, where people begin to make and create and respond out of need. And in a way, the correlation of that with like vernacular architecture, for example, where people essentially made out of the needs of the time with the materials they had in close proximity to them or in which they could have access to. It's like that we almost need to continually readdress Speaking of urban, <laughs> it's, uh, I'm in Dublin at the moment, and yeah, this is just constant. Yeah, so um, readdressing how to approach design in dense urban areas, it's almost like because that correlation that I mentioned brings a whole new dialogue to approaching uh, urban design. Um, yeah, and I wonder if that's something that, yeah, you, you think it needs to constantly be questioned because it's always shifting and changing. Yeah, I agree that it's, uh, well, I don't want to be like this, uh, oh, I know it all, no? I hope that you're making this question not just to me, but anybody here. But I do think that we always have to, to change. And, um, and I guess something that motivated my, my, my lecture today was, um, that I see that things don't change. Like, uh, I don't know if I said uh, I'm from Mexico and I've studied in different places. I studied in Germany and then now I'm here in Finland and I've been in other countries and I just see the same stuff. And I'm like, well, how are we learning the same everywhere at the same, like, and it hasn't changed because I know many professors who would still talk about like, that we have to look up to this kind of modernism and, you know, um, and so many things about urban planning actually that are still kind of based on that, like for example, um, zonings are and stuff like that. No, but also it's different in other in different countries. But but that really surprises me that not only um, well maybe it doesn't surprise me that the result is then that we look at cities and they basically all look the same. But then like the, that means that the way it's being taught maybe it's still the same and it's it's like has been mentioned before, maybe very centric, I don't know if only Eurocentric, but definitely very American centric in, in Mexico in particular. So I think it has to not only be different at different times, but also different in different places. And, and that was kind of my question, what I want to ask you, everybody that they're watching that, well, how do we learn to see those things? And how do we learn, like, I'm not talking rhetorically, like if you have stories that you're, you say, you know, we had this experience and we learned that out of that experience, it would be great if somebody would like to share that experience uh, here today, tonight. <laughs> but it would be really great um, that it's not just me talking, that would be even better. <laughs> um, I can just maybe um, add in, like, um, I've really been questioning the idea of who is that expert and what is the expert expert of? um like why is this person being consulted and yeah uh because i've been looking into like children and planning quite a lot recently um and this idea of like allowing for children to be experts of their own environment uh, and it's really relevant with this idea of like not having a top top down attitude for planning with children but uh kind of uh, recognizing that they have their own social culture um, they're not in tr transitioning towards adulthood, which ties into adulthood, but uh, they're actually um, as much part of a cultural society as adults are. And the struggle of accepting that because they are communicating in a different language uh, or in a different way than the way that 
adults communicate. Um, and I think that's maybe relevant to so much more outside of uh, like planning with children. Um, it's about realizing that there are so many experts. There's not just like architects who are the experts of designing. There are other uh, people who are also experts, but there may be the language is not recognized yet somehow, if that makes sense. It's about being more inclusive to different types of language within the planning uh, industry. I think that if I can just quickly attach to that, um, it's it's quite interesting on, again, the topic of identity, because I was speaking with a pedagogist, I think it's called, recently. And um, while well, she's working with children and how the schools are completely wrong, the school system is completely wrong. We accept children as um, adults already that they from the prime like from primary school middle school high school they should learn all in the same way and she was telling me how for example children are still wild animal in a way and we are blocking them we are stopping them from doing that but it should be more a natural process and every person discover that at a different time so we are kind of designers or or whoever um, is behind the um, school system is kind of pushing the idea of taking away this kind of wild part of the child that is very important for their growth and for their identity. And maybe it's kind of the same in the urban environment at the same time. But um, I think there's also questions, Fiona, you were saying. Sorry. Uh, yeah, just sorry, uh, looking at the pad that there's quite a few questions now. Um, Dahlia, I'm not sure if you'd like to address some of them. Yeah, I see one that uh, I like actually. It says, what mediums do you use to explore the, as you say, unseen? Is photography a key technique or do you explore other means actually? It says, what? Sorry, got a one-year-old. <laughs> Super, I know this. Um, anyways, um, what I use uh, in my I really love stories of people, so I do interviews, a lot of interviews, and um, and all of my I have I'm following uh, twenty projects, and I've been only to Huerto Tlatelolco and to Huerto Roma Verde, so everything has to be through their stories, and I think it's very, I can tell you a little anecdote I didn't want to, but but this one really kind of clicked. We um, I was teaching in Mexico, and um, students had to design. That was the the task they had to design. Um, a kindergarten and we started um, to do interviews in different kindergartens and the little and the task was first that they had to decide where in the city this kindergarten would be each of them would have their own personal uh, site and at the same time that they're doing that course they're they're learning to use the tools the digital tools from the geography and statistics and then the first thing that came to their minds well I'm going to look at these they had these kind of um um, maps, or I don't know how to call it right now, I, I lost the word, but that, that had like in this square, there's like 20 kids and in this one, there's zero. And in this one, there's five, you know, these kind of statistics and maps. Um, and um, so that's how they were decide, deciding where they would put a kindergarten. So then we decided to go and make an interview. And this interview was in a public kindergarten in, in, in my city, which is Querétaro, and it's quite central. And then we were talking with the, 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 this director of that place and she started to tell us that the children that come there actually don't even live there, that they actually come from a quite marginalized area where there's, okay, there's not many kindergartens there, but the thing is that they take the decision to bring their children there because uh, the grandparents have to pick them up. It has to be close to the grandparents. So there you have a completely other uh, social constellation happening. Another, you know, things that you really, it doesn't tell you anything to see a map and to see, oh, so many children live here. It's actually, um, and then we started to interview other moms and they would say, actually, I choose the kindergarten to a place that is close to my parents because... Uh, kindergartens close at 12 <laughs> in the afternoon and or in the at noon actually and moms have to work dads have to work uh, and it's the grandparents who have to pick up the kids so this was for me why I decided that uh, talking to people is super important that is one thing photography I also agree is um, is an important mean as well yeah 
but that is for me it's really talking to people that I enjoy and I think in their stories there's a lot of images also and urban experiences or experiences right and and I think that that's also super important. Thanks, thanks Dalia. I just uh, I found a quiet corner. Well, quietish. Uh, no, thanks very much for that. It was really good, great talk as well. Um, and how do do you get involved much uh, in the kind of side of things about sort of synthesizing that information, you know, back into a design process or uh, talking to architects, designers, you know, city influencers about how they might take that information and synthesize it back into to, to sort of future thinking. I'm not sure I understood everything. Well, yeah, I don't know, if, is it the accent or is it the words? Uh, both. A little bit of both, <laughs> yeah. I just wondered if, and I missed, uh, I missed the, the very start of your talk, so apologies if you've, you've done this already. I was just interested to know in your practice whether you get involved in the kind of synthesis of this information that you're gathering, these stories, and how they can influence architects or designers or urban planners or decision makers. Is that synthesis something that you get involved with or are you more about the kind of collating and presenting? Well, first of all, I'm not, I, I'm not practicing architecture anymore. I'm a doctor, a researcher right now. And I'm really, I got really interested in these abandoned spaces and how people uh, were transforming them. You know, this is my, my interest. How this influence further, it has actually, um, in a way of, or I feel, no? but this I think is for everybody to do in their own way. I don't know, it helped, it has helped me to learn that maybe our role or my role at least um, is not anymore about taking the paper and starting to draw and to think of the space. Maybe it's something else. And I think, it, and I think that has to do with uh, the historical context that we're on, that I don't think we should precisely keep on designing and building and building and building, that maybe we have to find other roles for ourselves. And, and it has influenced, for example, um, well, I don't want to go, much in detail but if if I, I've been invited to projects and how then but usually th these are projects that are very related to spaces that had been abandoned had been reappropriated have been relatively established and they they were losing that kind of space again right because the governments might want those spaces back or the owners or whatever so in that kind of situation what role then um, was mine so this is what what these stories influenced actually to see that um, that maybe there's another role that is not precisely like I'm going to take the pencil and start to think of a space or a design, but that there's something different maybe that I can do and contribute to this built environment. And there was somebody um, who I'm going to put on the spot because she does this actually. Uh, Elena, are you there? I see her name, but I don't know if she's there. And, and she also does this kind of um, working with um, uh, spaces that have been, hey, hey, Alina. Okay, let's see. It's very informal. <laughs> <laughs> Were you already sleeping? <laughs> Oh, it kind of broke the connection. I don't know. Well, while she gets her connection back, um, there is a space. Um... Can you hear me? <laughs> now I can hear you. Yeah, now. So, even. Okay. What, what, what were you thinking of, Dalia? <laughs> Well, that what you do. There's, for example, it's um, it's an industrial area in um, here in Tampere, where I, where we live yeah. in, in in Finland, and um, it it used to be a paper mill or something like this. And then I think it was empty for many years. And then a lot of uh, new groups started to take take over. If you want to tell a little bit about that, but then also mm -hmm. your role within that, because it's also not the role of um, uh, and because you were also an architect. I don't know. Yeah. And uh, how you see your role changing, I think that's very interesting. Okay, yeah, well, I'll try to share some thoughts. So, um, yes, I'm also a researcher and, uh, and, and about in the same uh, steps as, as Dahlia is going on. So, 
so doc doctoral thesis is coming on but but like the basis of i think it was almost like 10 years ago when i started to realize that um there are other ways to affect the city than than doing the actual actual planning or design and 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 sometimes those might be even more um how to say more effectful tool that you could make a bigger impact by doing actions that are somehow mm, that are yes political but but then they are informed on something that you have learned through the research so so for example um, in the case of of this Hiedaranta area in in Tampere it was it's an old industrial area that um, uh, there was a big planning um, uh, competition held uh, 2017 and and just at the moment when it was uh, published that uh, the winning entry uh, we saw lots of promise in the wi winning entry but but unfortunately in Finland often it happens that when when whoever wins something there are lots of crazy and good ideas but then when the um phase where things are realized starts the good ideas drop out uh, one by one and and you end up with having the same uh, boring uh, stuff than than always so we decided a group of us there was a couple of people from environmental politics and and uh, uh, so other urban uh, researchers that we will in a way help this winning entry to gain more uh, publicity by opening uh, um, a discussion in a way that that we we proposed for the city that before you start planning anything more after the winning entry uh, let's open open this uh, up to kind of a co-creative process so so it was a series of five workshops and, and some couple of hundreds participants and through that workshop, actually, the I, I have now the feeling and the hunch that many of the ideas of the of the competition are getting rooted or have become rooted and, and are going to be at least a little bit more um, realized than without without this intervention of ours. And so we didn't have anything to do with the winning entries, but we in a way helped uh, them to. And actually also to develop further there were some stuff in the entry that the, that uh, it was good that it was um, under discussion and, and in a way um, people could uh, the citizen could uh, show also that, that there are parts that need to be done differently so that is that is one way that I, I see there is a different role uh, kind of very kind of activist but then again uh, there were motives from um, uh, informed from the from the research and from learning from different other earlier exper experiences that, that this could be some, something that we could do and okay let's let's just <laughs> try so so that's that's one thing and then uh, maybe other um, is we've been assisting um, kind of an experiment to build a public sauna with people there also in the same area and it's it's another project where um, the planning and maintenance uh, started with the people it was just a call for whoever who were interested and it took some years before we got into the state of really building something and and uh, and then also well yeah the, the it was great to get it built. It was running for young, one year, and, and now it's the moment when, uh, of course, it's, it's it's a challenge to maintain something like a public open sauna with uh, with people without any kind of a real uh, how to say real organization. But uh, but it's been enlivening the place a lot, and um, and yet again here it's the more kind of an enabler and bring someone who is bringing people together than really even again drawing a line yeah yeah 
I just wanted to say, say because uh, related a little bit to what you were saying that the sauna was working kind of for one year in this kind of self-organized way. And um, someone asked also this relationship between these spaces in Latin America that have been appropriated. And now um, what is the relationship of those new um, interventions with the rest of the community? And one thing that I have learned is that uh, voluntary work is an... Um, is an uh, how do you say scarce resource, and it comes a point where where who who there like I have noticed that the ones that continue it's because they're really these kind of life projects that they have decided this is going to be my life, and some people criticize uh, some of these people because of that decision. But if they don't do it, nobody else is going to do it. Yeah. So yeah. this is this is very interesting. Uh, what I have found in in those projects that I that I follow, that at the end is kind of just community. We come together. Sometimes it's not like that. It's not this kind of pretty picture at all. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I, I can really agree on that. It's it's something that you sauna is a very easy thing bringing Finnish people together because everyone has a connection to sauna and and it's something that everyone has in their heart and and. But, but then again, it, it means that it will bring together very different kinds of people from very, very different backgrounds, different ages, with different motives. And, and it's, it's been, uh, it's, um, it's sometimes like a miracle that how they can do something together. <laughs> and okay. It's, it's, it's a beautiful in a way to see when it happens. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, any more comments or questions? <laughs> yeah, I think unless someone has the last couple of comments, I think we'll wrap it up there. I think there are a few on Padlet, but I don't know if you think you already covered things or... someone is saying how can we revive a place if the identity is lost are there ways to show up i think <laughs> what is architecture <laughs> that is a good question Wait, which one sorry um there's a question that says um well i lost it um what is architecture the modernist block or the spontaneous yet chaotic reappropriation or maybe something in the middle. I think you kind of reply to that. But... Well, someone asked again about uh, this identity. No, how can we revive a place if it lost its ident identity? I think just give it a new one. <laughs> like, but it's really hard work. It's not like, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I have to say that I, I lost my heart a bit in the the normal way of architecture and this thinking that I could do uh, from afar or have the power to exactly you not know, change the identity just by drawing it or by thinking it in my head and it's gonna happen. And that I just don't think that's gonna happen that way. So if you think, uh, if you want to give something identity, I think then just give it to it. And I have seen places here in, in Finland and of course all of the projects that I follow, they give it a new identity. And sometimes it is just for one day or three days because there's some, some of them are fleeing and, and they're not there anymore. So, and I think that's also okay. And then it says, what are the roles of governments and authorities? And that is also very important. And I wonder if Alina also can share, but I can tell a little bit about the cases that I spoke about, Huerto um, Tlatelolco. So one of the issues of the temporary urban, uh, temporary urbanism or temporary uses is what exactly are we talking about when we talk about time? And, uh, and some people say, well, it's only, you can only call it temporary uses if it's la planned to last just a few days or a few weeks or like there's this time limit. And, um, but actually I feel like in the projects, not in all of them, but of course, definitely in Huerto Tlatelolco and in Huerto Roma Verde, there is this precariousness of the work. So they work with 
complete uncertainty that someone might come and take everything away. And you know what? I have seen it also here in Finland. And I don't know if uh, here in Ranta would be a case, but definitely in Helsinki, there's a place called Lapin Lahti Lehte. And they uh, have been giving life to this building for so many years already. And all of a sudden comes the government and says, you know what? Um, now we want to sell the place. And, you know, people have made their lives around that. So there's this precariousness. So, so, um, so in the case, for example, of Tlatel so in the case of Lapin Lahti, well, the role of government was a bit, uh, in the case of Tlatelolco, they started to see value. They weren't going to do anything with those abandoned places. It's not like in Europe that then there will be urban development and then these are used even strategically to, to give new value and then they keep them away. No, this is not probably not going to happen there. And um, and now the government, some more local governments have given them permission to stay there. No, but it has to be public. They cannot use, they cannot make money out of it. So that makes it even harder, right? Because they have to organize events and they have to um, communicate to people. They have to keep it alive, but they have zero money to do that. But the role of government in that case is like, okay, we give you the space. You know, that's already kind of kind of good, but there could be some more protections. In the case of Puerto Roma Verde, well, they are completely um, an occupation. So there the role of government has also kind of to overlook what's happening and then let them function. But they, of course, could the, the, the property is not uh, of the government. So th that one's a tricky one. And it, of course, they can lose those um, elements really quickly. But yeah, Elina, if you want to add, I don't know how it is with the buildings here, for example, what is the role of government within that? Is there any support from the governments, actually? Yeah, well, it's, it's a local, uh, it's it's a city that is supporting greatly the development of the area in Hiraranta. And first of all, in the way that they opened it up uh, for very different kinds of users and uses in 2016, uh, in a way that the rents were really low uh, and still the city would provide a very like like the basic um, that you have a water warmth and, and some like uh, other other basic um, needs are fulfilled and and then of course the city has also um, there has been a certain amount of money to put into basic renovation of spaces and yet you have also had a groups of um, actors such as skateboarders who built their own um, inside a skate pool into one part of the industrial buildings in a way that they invested themselves their time and, and their uh, the money that they could collect. So it's it's been a very complex uh, like collaborations in, in several points, but yet again, the city has been the, the big thing that they have done was uh, has been the attitude that they have been open for these kind of um, several different kinds of experiments and also in, in the case of sauna it was even more clearly the way that city provided funds for materials and also they provided the lot uh, and uh, what we needed to do as a group of actors that was researchers students uh, local activists and uh, and uh, people from different communities around the area was that we build it, that, that we plan, uh, we build and we maintain. So it's, they are very, this kind of um, strange companionships. But that's really nice from them <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because that's not always the case. <laughs> yeah. uh, hey, I just have a question uh, about the identity. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you lost hope in Again, like keeping an identity. So I'm just thinking, sh should the identity be, the new identity, should it be inspired by the identity that vanished or is vanishing? Because that, and like, I I'm from the Middle East and I feel like that's the, uh, specifically the Arabian Gulf. And I feel like that's the direction we're going towards, like just the loss of identity. And I don't know, like, is it, so if you, the, the, basically the question is, yeah, uh, is, should it be inspired by the past identity or no? 
Um, for me, I guess it's up to you to answer that question. I completely have identity issues, I must confess. I've, I'm Mexican, but I've lived a lot of my life uh, elsewhere. And I have family that is, um, my husband, he's German, and I have a daughter who is growing up in Finland and she doesn't speak my language. And so I'm the wrong person to talk about what actually is identity and, and what it does. I don't know. I cannot answer that, but maybe someone else, uh, exactly the people from ISM, maybe have something to comment about identity and... Um, I think I have a small comment. I don't know if I'm speaking on behalf of ISM or just in general here, but um, I think something really important to note is that identity is never something static. It's something that always uh, changes and that maybe that's the most important thing about identity is that it's dynamic and it's changing and there various ways in which identity changes, whether it be through colonialism and imperialism when someone uh, imposes an identity, but it's more or less merged with the local identity, whether it's globalized identity that has changed us all, um, whether it's identity that has changed due to um, crisis, whether it be natural disasters, man-made disasters, etc. Uh, so that identity is never something but in terms of your question itself, I'm, I'm partially from the Middle East as well, and I can definitely see that as something that is happening uh, with losing identity, but we need to be very careful about uh, creating a pastiche or being nostalgic about it. So it's not really genuine if you um, copy the vernacular, and it's not very genuine if you take something that is common for, I don't know, Belgium and just apply it to Doha or somewhere what you need to mm -hmm. I, I guess what you need to be doing is critically assessing what is the vernacular and one of the most important things about the vernacular is not just the fact that it's local to an area but the fact that it usually takes into consideration resources climate etc so um, these buildings that have been built all around the world especially the um, small residential ones that are so so traditional they are like that for a reason, because they are trying to tackle climate in a certain way. That's why probably the most uh, successful buildings in different areas are the ones that have been locally created, it is locally sourced materials, etc. So it's, I don't think that you can ever go back to an old identity, because as I said, things change, these things change with the challenges that countries are facing and the challenges that nations face. And basically identity visualizes all of these challenges. So making sure that you combine what is uh, contemporary and what is um, controversial at a certain point and try and combine it with a vernacular and a dialogue rather than just either copy uh, the past or copy what is um, contemporary or modern. Um, so it's, it's, it's neither one of the two polarized things, it's something in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Deb, thank you. Thank you. That does make sense. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the answer. I think that's kind of a hot topic. Yeah, it seems. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> in, in a way, when I, for example, um, maybe this sounds more stupid, but when I was in, like, we were designing in Australia and we were in contact with Aboriginal people and we were supposed to take out the identity of Aboriginal people. And that's kind of hard because in a way um you know after colonization they kind of stop in a way their um traditional architecture or traditions so the question was like what if colonization never happened or if happened just for example globalization happened what would it be today aboriginal culture and aboriginal um because it, it wouldn't be, it, it would not be the same as it was before for sure but then it was always the the borderline what would it be today and it, it's very complicated but very interesting at the same time i think that's also a way of related Valia, you get interviews and uh, actual people engagement to research and understand what's possibly going on in an area because we have to be so difficult if we're dealing with the discourse of architecture that we don't project an identity onto a collective or community, society, nation, etc. Because that's exactly what we're trying to say with this publication. There is no answer, but let's try to figure it out. Let's take an attempt. And 
I love that Dalia, you really express uh, the different use of mediums because I think that's so important in architecture to move things forward, that it's not always just the 2D drawing or the other traditional means that were learned, that were taught in architecture school that like, um, you know, in regards, in the context of trying to see what's unseen, creativity and not expecting a particular outcome is a really key aspect, I think, because you never know what you're going to find. And one of those creative things is engaging with people because uh, you can be an architect your whole life and not truly engage with the community or with your clients on a level of how they actually live or how they may want to live, et cetera. So, yeah. I think it was really good as well, Dalia, that you brought up the fact that you shouldn't romanticize it either, because I think there's a danger to romanticize uh, certain types of identities, and that's also dishonest, because um, you were mentioning that people aren't doing this in some sort of like, always in this kind of like community spirit that we're wanting to envisage, but it's actually through hardship, and um, it's important to not neglect that or to not to uh, appreciate that as well. Yeah, maybe I can continue still uh, on, on the same subject, subject because I think it was it was interesting that you were talking about this, how, how an architect might work uh, without engaging really the, with the people or, um, or, or with the community that is going to use a building or something that has been drawn. Uh, some like three years ago, I, I was uh, by accident, uh, uh, I came across with a couple of different um, architecture firms from, I think they were mostly from Denmark and some were from Holland that were using ethnography uh, uh, together with their how to say with the in in their firm really that before they plan they had ethnographers uh, working with them in trying to understand to whom they are actually doing the design and what is the context where they are doing the design and then also after the building like maybe one year after it has been in use they do the ethnography uh, studies again and and really take in the feedback what is coming that that did they actually succeed in what they were doing and how they could have done better or how they could still maybe do some things a little bit better, maybe alter some something. And I think that was really like, what, what a courage, <laughs> what guts <laughs> uh, they had uh, in, um, in really confronting the users in, in, in this way. And I think um, going back to identity, it really puts the identity of the know-it-all architect in the spot right and that might be something that needs to change because i do how can it be that we don't go back to buildings and see if what we did works it, it's almost like oh we're so superior that i don't need to go back and see right so that puts really this um confronts us with our, our own created identities of you know like um that we know it all that things are going to be perfect that you know this kind of I don't know. At least that's how it was for me in my school and my in my uni in my architectural upbringing, and always having the guy who would yell at you if you couldn't say like with numbers why you did certain things and and stuff like that. So it was this kind of. I think that's really beautiful to have this kind of collective and also kind of multidisciplinary. Uh, groups and I have to say that that is something I found uh, interesting in Finland that the planning uh, offices have the geographers very often even sociologists and stuff like this but in Mexico this is never going to happen but yeah I don't know should we anybody have any really beautiful words to to end this Eduardo no I think that's up to you Dalia Let's oh my gosh with, <laughs> with a message <laughs> Again, the where was it? I am afraid that if we see, if I am afraid that if they would see what we see, they wouldn't give us a chance to do what we do with the things we see. <laughs> I think we can learn to see the things we don't see from the ones who see what we don't want. And with that, I end this beautiful lecture. <laughs> Now Thank we all you. need like 10 minutes to understand that and then... But it's there. Make it so we... <laughs> I have to read that. Thank times. you. <laughs> Super.
thank you so much for your presentation, so Dahlia. And thank you to ISM for adding in your presentation. Uh, it was a really good chat. And hopefully we'll see you all at our next lecture in a few weeks. And if I can add just something, thanks everyone for being here and give your voice. That was cool. And I, I think we should also thank all the people behind this. So everyone through one team that could organize this and make it happen. So thank you guys and wherever you are in the world and have a safe night. <laughs> and wear thank a mask. You. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Everybody. Bye.